my goal was hopefully to make maybe a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars within my first year of real estate which is also unheard of in your first year of real estate usually and by the end of the first year we had done over a million dollars in in commissions and then from there it's it's grown over the last three years now over, over six million we're, we're crushing every other real estate agent in the market because even if they're if they're making two call two hours of calls per day five days a week it would take them 143 years to to equate to what we did in a one-year time frame hey there and welcome to another episode of the jack Boss show today we are going to talk about well real estate right and we are actually having an exquisite show ready for you guys uh because my guest uh, levi lasik is a um u.s iraq combat veteran turned power realtor having sold over 200 million dollars in real estate and it's just in his first three years um and he's actually teaching realtors how to get prospects and so i mean there's a lot more to that he's an active real estate investor involved in multifamily things like that it's a it's an it's an incredible guy so i i'm, I'm super excited to have him on on the show so welcome levi yeah thanks for having me appreciate it Wonderful. So uh, great. So first of all, let's quickly give you a chance for an introduction before we dive right into what we want to talk about, because I don't think I've ever had anyone on the show that actively works with real estate agents. So I can't wait to dig into that. All right. Yeah, sure. I mean, I became a real estate agent reluctantly. So this is not something that I ever aspired to do or said I wanted to be whenever I grew up. It just kind of happened. And I had a successful financial services business uh, for the last five years leading up to 2020. I worked with teachers at schools on their retirement planning. So I was having the best time in my life. I was uh, had a teacher schedule, but I had five times the teacher's income. So I was traveling the world on my off time. I really worked about eight months of the year. And so during the summer, I would travel sometime weeks at a time. And I went to 24 countries inside of three years. And that business was steadily growing each week. 2019 was my best financial year. And then 2020, the first quarter started out to be my best quarter. I was outpacing 2019 by 40%. Wow. So I was really excited for 2020 and then the world shut down. So, you know, it was like, well, okay, school shut down, travel shut down. I mean, basically the two things I was most heavily involved in were closed. And when how I looked did, at- How did that affect, how did that, sorry if I quickly can interrupt, how did that affect the teachers, the teacher salaries and things like that? Did that, did that have a big impact on it? or not well of course no i mean of course they're going to keep paying the teachers and you know they they figured out at least by summertime that they were going to go to uh you know remote learning i mean they tried that whole experiment right but at the time whenever that all happened in uh, march or april of 2020 we had no clue what was going to happen so they kind of rode out the rest of the year until summertime but i just i didn't know would schools ever open back up again are we ever going to get out of this mess i mean there are so many unanswered questions and if you could imagine that was four years ago now which right. is crazy right and that's how quickly time flies but that's also how fast you can change your life and change your business so i was 41 years old at that time basically out of work. And I'm sitting there at home like everybody else uh, at the beginning of 2020 asking myself, well, how do I start over without starting over? That was probably my biggest fear was being 41 years old and just felt like everything was just taken away from me. And I know a lot of people probably face that as well. So I just uh, took some time over the summer of 2020 to really start doing some research and trying to figure out like, what's my next move? Because I was helping teachers with retirement planning. Not a single one of them wanted to talk about retirement planning. Some of them were asking how to pull money out of their retirement accounts. So they weren't even thinking about saving money. So again, the my future was uncertain. So I thought, well, maybe this is a time I need to pivot. And I've got friends in real estate, uh, especially real estate agents, but I just never really wanted to be a real estate agent. But they uh, kept telling me, hey, you are you would be great at this. You know, I, I, they know me. They know my work ethic. They know I'm a fast learner. They know I'm going to go 100 percent all in if I go do something. But again, I just I did not like the sound of being an agent because I felt like it was that person that, you know, talks to you. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the conversation, they give you a business card. Right. And they say, hey, I'm a real estate agent. Make sure you call me. And, I, you know, so I just had this stigma to it as well. Plus, they'd been in the game for, you know, 10, 15 years. So I didn't want to get into an industry that they were doing well in and then 
me struggle. That's that was another concern. I didn't want to get in and fail. I knew real estate agents have a very high failure rate in the beginning, just like most business owners. So I just kind of took some time over the summer of 2020 and just did some research and was thinking about it. And I decided not to watch Tiger King, by the way, and just uh, really dig in and try to learn as much as possible about a couple of different industries. Now, I did some investments. I actually spent a lot of money doing some other uh, investments that I that I knew weren't going to be immediate, but I, I wanted to give them a try anyways. But ultimately, by the end of 2020, I was kind of out of options. And so I said, you know what? All right, if I'm going to do this real estate thing, I want to have a plan. And if I can put together a plan and see how I could how I could possibly be successful, then I'll get into real estate. And I think a lot of people get into real estate or get a license and they don't have a plan. They get a license because somebody told them they should or they think about it or they watch the show on TV and then they don't really know how to generate business and, and what their next steps are. So I did it the opposite. I said, okay, let me see if I can figure out a, a plan first. And if I can see some what of a good outcome or at least something in the first year that I could generate some income, then then I'll get into real estate and go 100% go all in and that's that's just how I work. But what do you do during that time? I mean, I didn't want to be a real estate agent because I didn't want to cold call. I didn't want to door knock. I didn't want to pass out business cards. There was no networking events going on in 2020 because of the, the lockdown. So, you know, all these uh, s scenarios didn't sit well with me. So I thought, OK, if I want to attract business instead of chase it, you know, I, that's probably going to be through social media. But at 41 years old, I also had zero social presence. So I was one of those people. And I think a lot of 40 year olds and above have that love hate relationship with social media, you know, because we didn't grow up with it in high school. It wasn't there in college. And, you know, we kind of got on some platforms just because our friends and family were there. And I just never turned it into anything. I had uh, 300 followers on Instagram. I actually opened an Instagram account in 2011 and had 300 followers over over the last uh, 10 years, right? So uh, basically, my friends and family never tried to do anything on Facebook or or even uh, I, I dabbled in some YouTube in 20, 2011, but fizzled out because why? I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a plan in place. So this time I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to figure out one platform. I'm going to choose one platform and I'll go all in on that platform. But which one? Because there's all these social platforms. And I think that's another mistake that entrepreneurs, agents, uh, you know, new business owners make is that people also tell them, hey, you need to be on every platform, right? You need to get your message out there as much as possible. So they they sign up and open up accounts on five different platforms, and then they end up putting 20% effort across five different platforms instead of 100% effort into one, mastering one and actually generating some business. So I didn't want to fall into that trap either. So after researching all the platforms, uh, I, I, I figured out that uh, YouTube is actually a search engine, not a social media platform. So that intrigued me. I was like, OK, I don't have to be a dancing real estate agent on TikTok. Right. So I was like, all right, that's good. So uh, as I learned more and more about YouTube and how it's a search engine, I thought, OK, that sounds uh, more my style, because what I realized was that. I was not a great real estate agent. I had never done a transaction before. I never sold somebody a home, right? I never written a contract. So it felt inauthentic to me if I wanted to jump on the other platforms, like most real estate agents were on there making all these great educational videos, telling stories about the clients they had helped or saving them money. And I had none of that. So I was like, okay, I could read information online and regurgitate that. But again, it didn't feel authentic to me. But what I started to realize is that people are searching, you know, Dallas, Texas neighborhoods and Dallas, Texas suburbs. And so I'm like, I, I go, okay, well, I've lived in Dallas for 20 plus years. I know Dallas. I know the areas. I know the neighborhoods. And if I can make content on the neighborhoods they're searching about, there's already an established audience there looking for that content. So I'm not making things about just what I want to make. I'm making things that people are already searching for. They're lo already looking for those answers. And right. so that's what I started to do. And that's how I, I decided to, once I kind of saw that vision, I, I just said, okay, this is how I'm going to approach real estate. I'm not going to cold call and door knock and, and uh, you know, start some expensive postcard campaign or get have my face all over billboards or shake hands and kiss babies. I'm like, I'm going to 
make YouTube videos and I'm going to attract the business. And so I just built out that business plan. I studied YouTube for about two months, 60 days. And I said, I learned then that I believe you can hyper learn any subject in 60 days with the amount of information that's out there uh, right now, vlogs, blogs, YouTube, Google books, whatever you, you can just, if you just stop and just study that subject over the next 60 days, you'll, you'll probably be more proficient than 99% of the people out there in that subject. Uh, and so uh, people just don't take time to do that. And there's something admirable about just taking action and getting started. And I do believe that, but at the same time, if you take a little time before that and plan, you'll have a much clearer vision and at least an idea of where to go. So when things get tough or you get stuck, you're not sit there, you're not sitting there wondering, what do I do next? You just kind of follow your plan. So there's a ton of people that teach YouTube and I, and I bought eight different YouTube marketing books and I read them all and yes, they're boring, but I wanted to learn the platform. So I watched all these YouTube videos. I read blogs. I bought eight YouTube marketing books. I read all of those. And then I was, I was going, okay, I think I understand how to start on YouTube. I didn't know everything about it, but at least I knew, okay, when should I publish? How many videos a week should I do? What time of day should I publish? What type of content to make? How to structure a video? So I understood all of that going into it. And then I started creating those videos. And then my goal was hopefully to make maybe a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand at least, two hundred thousand. I thought if I'm lucky within my first year of real estate, which is also unheard of in your first year of real estate, usually. And by the end of the first year, we had done over a million dollars in in commissions. And then from there, it's it's grown over the last three years now over, over six million. And and that's allowed me to, you know, move into other industries and invest in multifamily now. And I don't want to be the a transactional real estate agent forever. So already taking steps in place so that I can be in a position to uh, you know, invest in my future versus just be caught up in transactions. On top of that, I don't even really deal with the clients. I mean, I say, really, I don't deal with the clients at all now. Now I just create the content and I have a team in place. So I don't open doors. I don't write contracts. Uh, you know, none of that. I just create the videos. And whenever the, the leads come in, they get passed on to the team. They take them out, do all the work from there. And once it's done, then, you know, I get my cut at the end of that. And that's how the business works. Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you. Wow, that was a very detailed, uh, like kind of like run up from how you, how you got into that and what it's turned into. So I want to unpack a few things here. So the first thing you, you kind of like throw in there from a side note that, that a lot of realtors fail in the first year. Why do you think that is? That they're not, a, well, a couple of reasons. They say the average real estate agent, and you could probably apply these stats to business owners as well in general. So uh, they say the average agent starts with less than $5,000 to their name. So they're usually transitioning or maybe they lost a job or you know whatever the case may be, they don't have a lot of money. And so that's why when they get into the business, they have to cold call, they have to door knock, they have to bug their friends and family because that costs them their time, not their money. That $5,000 is probably going to pay their bills, right? They're, they're not going to, and you could blow 5,000 in marketing like that in one month in real estate and not make a single penny. Uh, you have to usually spend uh, consistently, right? Over months and months to get a return almost on any type of marketing. So they come into the business with not a lot of money to their name. So that's what forces them into cold calling and door knocking and, and bugging friends and family. Now, that comes with a lot of rejection. And I think people realize real quickly how much work that takes and also how much rejection that is. And ultimately, people don't like to be rejected. And so they say, ah, you know what, maybe this isn't for me. And so they probably just get out of the business on their own. But yeah. if they're not effective at lead generation, ultimately, which is if they can't generate something from cold calling and door knocking or figure out something that works for them, that you're going to be out of business. And that's in any, any type of business. If you open a store, if you don't figure out how to get customers through the front door, uh, you're not going to have any business, right? So it's it, it comes down to lead generation and and resourcefulness and really uh, you know learning what what how to do that or a method. And again, I think you know not building out the right plan in the beginning in the first place. So at least you have some idea. And I look, I've got a very simple formula for success. It's served me well across 20 plus years and uh, four to five different industries. I've applied the same same formula for success, which is. Who's at the top? 
What are they doing? How did they get there? How can I model that? And then can I do better than them? So that's simple. I always look at, look, whatever industry you're in, whatever business you're starting, whether it's real estate, investing, finance, whatever the case may be, somebody's at the top of their game in that industry. So just go straight to the top and say, okay, how did they get there? What are they doing right now? How did they get there? You know, is there any application that I can start applying right now? But I don't want to just copy and I just don't want to rip off. I, I want to model. I want to model, but I want to adjust it to fit my personality so it seems authentic and it seems real. And then ultimately, I always want to know, can I do better than the the teacher basically, right? So they become the teacher and they're the teacher, even if they don't know me, right? Because I could... Right now, you could watch almost any successful person's YouTube channel, right? I mean, they, they're pretty much out there giving it all away for free. And if you studied one uh, entrepreneur in your field of business just on YouTube alone, you'd probably have a really good idea of how to get started in that industry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's go into YouTube. So you selected YouTube. Uh, you started in about 2020 after the summer when you figured out the business model. Uh, obviously, YouTube at that time was really well established already and with lots and lots of different people on there. But did you see, did you find that the top realtors are doing your strategy or did you realize that they're not and saw it as a gap in the market? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's funny. In 2020, I think it was a huge gap in the market. Of course, I looked in Dallas and there was really two main agents, two, two out of tens of thousands of agents in Dallas, Texas. And I, that's the other thing I was thinking about is like, how do I break into the Dallas market? One of the most well-established real estate industries, some of the top brokers and team leaders in the country. I mean, brands that have been around for decades. You know, how am I going to get my foot in the door and go onto YouTube? And there's two, two agents that really had a, a good presence. One of them had 7,000 subscribers. The other one had 5,000. So I also looked at them and I said, okay, what are they doing? How many videos are they publishing? What are they being consistent? Where Where is the gap in their content marketing on YouTube? And how can I adjust that? And what I also realized was that I thought, okay, if they're only making one video a week, which each of those people were only making one video a week, I thought if I'm ever going to catch them or at least have the opportunity to catch them, I need to do three videos a week, right? I've got to triple their outcome and and maybe one day I'll catch up to them. And it took about a year and a half. And whenever the top channel was at 13,000 subscribers, I caught them at 13,000 subscribers. So they had 13,000 subs and then I had 13. They started with a 7,000 sub head start. I started with zero. We met at 13 and now I'm about to hit 32,000 subscribers and they're about to hit 15,000 subscribers. So now I've even doubled their subscriber count and, uh, and I That's generated- That's a big deal because what I think people don't necessarily see or if, if you're if the audience listening to it is like, well, 32,000 subscribers, well, big deal if other people have millions and things like that. Well, you're talking about hyper-focused regional subscribers. Nobody's yeah. gonna follow you if they live in New York City, right? Unless they want to move to Dallas and they want to move into one of these neighborhoods. But if they're happy in New York, they're not going to ever go look for XYZ neighborhood in Dallas and find you. It's These are the people that live in Dallas. They're looking to move around in Dallas, move from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. They, are, uh, they have friends and family in Dallas. And so these are the people that are literally your customers that are every, on average in the United States, every five to seven years, somebody's reselling uh, selling their property. Uh, like every five to seven years, they're coming around and they're looking for, for that realtor. And they're like, I remember that guy that I watched the videos on, let me go contact them. And then they tell other people about it. Somebody wants to move in, a friend wants to move into the area. Hey, there's a good realtor. I fo followed all his stuff. So this is worth way more than having 200,000 followers that follow your TikTok dances, right? Because <laughs> Like they're following it because you dance goofily, not you. I mean, not you or I. We obviously awesome, awesome dancers, right? But uh, but they they follow somebody because they 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 created like this one really go viral funny movie. But it has nothing to do with their services. It's nothing to do with that. They just like followed them because I thought it was cool, and it doesn't immediately it doesn't translate into that person actually being a customer. Yours does. So thirty two thousand is a huge amount of highly targeted 
followers uh, in a very specific market. So congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Right. So um, the, the next thing is then, uh, so um, you talked about hyper learning every subject in, in any subject in 60 days. Now, where do you as a person, you said like you have those, you have that that programming, that rule in your life that, hey, look at what do the top people do? Uh, what, uh, who are the top people? What do they do? How can I model them? And how can I become better than them? Where did that come from? Where did you learn that? That's a, that's a very, very good insight. And it's a very, uh, very solid and, 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 and proven uh, method to success. But did you just wake up one day and come up with that? <laughs> you do a lot of like self-improvement kind of stuff or how did you uh well, I, th I mean, I think I kind of came up with those steps, but I think the original idea, um, it, now that you're making me go back in memory, probably the original idea, I'm sure I've heard Tony Robbins, I believe, say that, look, model, he probably said like model success, right? Or success leave clues, yeah. uh, leaves clues. That, that, those types of sayings I've heard before. I think Tony said that. And and so I think that's just embedded in my brain. Now, I think the the parts where, uh, how can I model that? Really? I think that came from, I heard a lot of people say in industries, they always say rip off and duplicate. And you'll hear a lot of coaches use that term and they'll say, Hey, R and D, right. Rip off and duplicate. And that's never set well with me. I've always been kind of like, eh, I don't want to just rip off. Even if somebody gives me permission, you know, from stage or on a video or something like that and say, Hey, just rip off and duplicate what I'm doing. I always, I never felt well about that. I never felt good. So I just, I came up with modeling, right? Uh, I would rather model somebody use them and model is really more of just like, what, what are the frameworks that they're using? And I can apply because they don't even have to be in my industry, which again, I, I learned YouTube from a lot of people that taught YouTube. And then I thought, how do I adjust that to fit real estate? You know? So, so I think the, the, the remainder of those steps just kind of came through my own experience. And whenever I'm training or teaching or coaching, you're always trying to figure out ways to simplify and to be able to pass that message on. So I think that's where the back half of that came from was how do I model that? And then the last one is how can I do better? Any industry I've ever been in, which is, um, you know, I've been in uh, uh, gym membership sales. I went to pharmaceuticals, financial services, and then in real estate. And even whenever I was young in gym membership, my original mentor you know, he was the top. And I always thought, I always asked him, what'd you do in your first year? When I got into pharma sales, the, my mentors in, in pharma sales, I was like, what did you do your first year? When I went into financial services, my mentor, I said, what did you do your first year? So that told me the potential, you know, what could be, and they always had high numbers. And so I always said, well, if they did that in their first year, can I do one dollar more? Can I do one thousand dollars? You know, can I do ten thousand more in production or sales or whatever? The, I just thought, can I beat them? So that just was my own thought process of uh, not not from a pride, just from a, a, a competitive standpoint. I was like, okay, I got your number. Now I know that number is possible in my first year, but can I one up them? And I think that's the biggest compliment to any teacher or coach, right? If the student can actually pass them up. So I never told them, Hey, I'm going to beat your, I'm going to beat your results. Right. I was, I wasn't arrogant about it. That was internal. I just told that to myself. Okay. That was there. That's what they hit their first year. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to set that as my benchmark and in every single industry that i moved into, I did that. And, and, uh, and so that's uh, maybe just because I set my mind to that and that was something that I wanted to achieve. And so I think that's the most important one. If you really want to be the best at what you do, then, then figure out whoever you're learning from or your mentor or the top salesperson in your company or whatever the case may be, figure out what, what did they do their first year and set that as your benchmark. Yeah. And I like, uh, I agree with you. Rip off and duplicate has never resonated well with me either because it, it also doesn't give space for individuality. It doesn't give space yeah. to actually make it better. It's just like, hey, this works. Rip it off, duplicate it. But it doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone is Tony Robbins. Not everyone is the the smooth operator of whatever kind of like the salesperson. Somebody's an introvert. How do they adjust it? You can't if they take something from an extrovert and just rip off and duplicate. It just doesn't work the same way because they they just. They're, they're different people and so on. So uh, I, I like the modeling a lot because that word almost um, is related to the mentor model because uh, you basically 
you look at something that works, you make it your own, you adjust it, you 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 fit it into your life and into your model, and and then you and modeling is like it's like you model clay when you're little, right? And it, it's like it has in it the word like of adjusting it and making it your own, making it something unique. So I, I like that. So let's talk about the videos. So what do you typically share in those videos? How do they look like? What do you what do you talk about there? So uh, so yeah, particularly if like if you let's say huh, like. Do you over time cover the all neighborhoods in Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth area, or are you going deep in certain neighborhoods? What what do you talk about in those neighborhoods that that make people actually and why are people searching neighborhoods on YouTube? Is the first thing. <laughs> like I'm actually not much on YouTube. I mean, obviously we have a YouTube channel, things like that, but I don't watch stuff on YouTube for hours on end. So yeah. I'm just curious, like what are people searching on YouTube relating to neighborhoods? Well, they're they're trying to learn. They're researching, and and you know, a, a purchasing a home or even selling your home is is usually one of somebody's biggest financial decisions in their life. Right. So, uh, and yes, the person in New York is actually watching our videos. The person in California, and now we were fortunate, you know, starting this at the end of 2020. We started in December of 2020. You know, of course, uh, there was a lot more restrictions on the West Coast and the East Coast than there was in Texas. You know, Texas came out of 2020 very quickly. We were kind of like after two months, we were like, all right, let's get back to work, you know. And that didn't happen on the West Coast and East Coast so much. And so guess what? And then work from home started happening. So we did hit really good timing in the market as far as people started to research. And then guess what? Travel restrictions. Uh, so people, it's not like they were just flying down every weekend. They started to do research online. And so that's that's where we we were able to capture that momentum. And, and we started to help out-of-state buyers and sellers uh, just every day. We've actually helped uh, people move from 15 different countries. So we've had people from Japan, from South Africa, from the Philippines, from Sweden to Belgium that have found us on YouTube. And and a perfect example was, you know, we got an email from somebody that said, hey, we're a family of six from Florida, but we've been living in Belgium for six years, but now we're getting relocated to Dallas, Texas. So guess what? You're living in Belgium or even California or New York. And all of a sudden your company says, well, we're moving, which that's happened a lot, right? A lot of, I'm sure you've heard the news of like even Elon Musk moving headquarters to Texas and you've got Hewlett Packard. You've got- uh, Obviously in a great market there. So Texas, uh, yeah. so basically the, particularly during COVID, uh, the Texas, Arizona, Florida, kind of like we, we went, I live in Arizona. We went through COVID after six weeks or so. We're like, yeah. okay, not- directly back to all the uh, yep. business, but back to like, Hey, let's go open the restaurants, have some fun and, and, and just stay away from each other a little bit in the stores. But yeah. uh, other than that, uh, it went back to pretty normal. Uh, yeah. So you're in an ideal rate. And of course, yes, the people who want to relocate into DFW all going to look at it. I could actually by now imagine that you've gained enough traction that, that again, and that's why my question is, what do you actually talk about in those videos? Because if it goes beyond and I'm, and again, we, we have a coaching company. We do a lot of online marketing. We do a lot of video creation and things like that. So, so my mind is starting to spin here right now. It's like, you could, uh, you could probably attract a lot of people outside of the markets. If you talk about just more generic things, like how to select your perfect home. Yeah. Right? And do you well, know like that? Too? Well, Mostly yeah, we kind of we kind of steer clear of like selecting your perfect home. We focus more on the neighborhood, uh, you know, so what does it involve? What it's what are the school? working? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are the yeah. What are the school? Yeah. So we don't we just try to educate on neighborhoods and, and areas and suburbs really versus like. Yeah. Uh, so what that means is that we'll we'll actually go out. I'll go in the community and walk the community. I'll walk the downtown area, the historic downtown area, the, the newly developed downtown area. We'll stop by a couple of the schools. We'll go into the neighborhoods and, and drive around. We do a lot of driving footage and drone footage and even walking. Like I'll just get out on the sidewalk and walk through a neighborhood and just talk about the neighborhood. So people feel as if they're walking shoulder to shoulder next to me through that neighborhood. And I'm just explaining them what's going on. This is a, this school district is rated this, you know, this amount, there's this many students, they, they've got some of the best sports programs in the country. So I just talk about things that people, you know, there's, there's uh, churches close by hospitals, you know, things that are important to people. And they say, okay. And of course, home values, 
uh, you know, what's the average home price. And so that gives people a good idea of the area. And that's how they're able to research. And you think about Dallas, Fort Worth is massive. It's massive. So many suburbs. And I couldn't tell you how many times we've gotten a phone call and they said, Oh, thank you so much. We're coming into town. We've narrowed it down to two areas based on your videos, which saves us a ton of time because instead of somebody coming here, cold turkey and saying, yeah, can you drive me all over Dallas and Fort Worth and show me every single suburb? They're, they're like, okay, they can eliminate areas yep. based on the videos we make. Cause And so it makes it so much easier. So we educate them on the communities, the different suburbs, and then I'll do simple videos, pros and cons, uh, you know, good and the bad of these areas, cost of living, uh, list videos, top five neighborhoods, top six suburbs, uh, those types of con uh, content is just really helps them, you know, make better decisions. Absolutely. Beautiful. Love that. I, 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 I yeah, this is, this is like, and it's so simple in a way. Yeah. Right? It's so simple because. And the, and, the, and the good thing is, yeah. And, and, you know, we can look at search data on YouTube and on Google. That's the other great thing. And so yeah. there's, it's, it's, it's almost cheating in a way because I could see what are the most searched suburbs around Dallas. So I could focus on those suburbs as well and draw, you know, a lot of attention by making those videos. And yes, I might, I've, I've got on one suburb, I've got at least 25 videos minimum. So I'm, I'm going to even try to saturate a particular suburb. So if anybody searches Frisco, Texas, I mean, I've got 25 chances, you know, one of my videos is going to pop up. With that said, are you going after the highest searched ones or are you doing the long tail kind of a strategy of finding the ones that are only have like 300 searches a year or 200 searches a year? And, but they're so highly specific that those 200 people are like almost automatic customers. No, I go after the highest search volume. Okay. <laughs> I want the most. Yeah, I want the most eyeballs. Okay. For a while, we played with uh, we played with a long tail strategy of where we basically uh, where you where if somebody searches a very specific term that's only going to be searched like a few hundred times a year, there's no videos out there except for ours. But ours answers their exact question. So as a result, they'd be like, "Well, these guys finally understand me, hear me." But uh, but I, I think in your in a specific local market, your strategy works. So particularly if you if you saturate it, then you create twenty five videos around that. Yeah, uh, very cool. So now let's talk about you. Uh, I, I, what I wanted to say is like, from a concept point of view, it's a it's 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 like one of these things. Like every realtor out there could have thought about that, but nobody did, right? Uh, the data is already out there. As a good real estate agent, you need to know the school rankings, like the growth rates, the price developments, the crime rates, all the stuff in neighborhoods anyway. So you're simply taking that and putting that into really well-created well uh, YouTube footage. And as a result, came out of the gate and created the million dollar uh, business out of it, which congratulations. So I, I like my non non existing hat off to you here. And, um, and now you turn this around and you're also teaching realtors about that. Tell me yes. about that. Yeah, well, we, uh, uh, we're, I think one year old now we came out with the book passive prospecting. So we coined this term passive prospecting. And of course you can just go to book.passiveprospecting.com if you want to get a, a copy there. And, it, you know, what we talk about is what I learned, though, is that by making these videos, I didn't have to prospect because once I published the video, it went to work for me. So now instead of me having a conversation with one client one day in a neighborhood, I kind of had that same conversation. I just did it on camera. And but now I'm giving the opportunity for 10, 100, 1000, 10,000 people to see that video. So now I've got 475 videos on the channel over the last three and a half years. And that's like uh, 475 versions of me prospecting instead of me picking up the phone and me uh, knocking on doors. And my favorite concept is one of the chapters in the book I talk about compounding your time. You know, people say that time is your most valuable resource. You can't get it back. It's not renewable. And that's not true. That's not true. And I talk about compounding time because, uh, I, for example, I, I'll, you know, our channel was watched 104,600 hours in one year. If you divide that by 24 hours in a day, that's equivalent to almost 12 years worth of prospecting that our channel did in a one year time frame. So, and if you broke that down to a video, 
I've got one video that's been watched uh, like 11,600 hours. You divide that by 24 hours in a day, that's equivalent to about 1.34 years. And it only took me 30 minutes to make that video. So I invested 30 minutes of my time, but that video has given, given me back 1.34 years worth of prospecting and it's still growing to this day. So to me, that's a compound return of my time. And, and if you invest in anything, if you're investing in stocks, real estate, crypto, it doesn't matter. I bet your number one question is always going to be, What's the return on my investment? What am I going to make back? Well, if time is really the most valuable asset, why are we not asking before we invest our time into something, what's going to be the return of my time? And that's what I love about YouTube is because it tells me in the analytics that exact return and I can see I'm getting a compound effect. And that's why we're, we're crushing every other real estate agent in the market because even if they're if they're making two call two hours of calls per day, Five days a week, it would take them 143 years to to equate to what we did in a one year time frame. Yeah, so they would, yeah. So that that is just irreplaceable. You could not get a team of inside sales agents to even come close to that because even if you had 10 inside at sales agents, they can only call one person at one time and only during a certain part of the time. Yeah, so whenever I look, they get crazy just answering the yeah. same questions again and again and again while they're already answered for you. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So one more one more question I want to I want to take this and like you have also now started to set it early on a transition in a way from just uh, from just and I don't mean it with a value but from only from the sole thing you're doing that's the word I want to use from the sole thing you do is being a realtor to also becoming an investor. Uh, to become an investor to be involved in multifamily we do multifamily we do land and. Uh, and and basically so that ultimately eventually potentially you get out of the transactional business of of realtor where you close a deal and you get paid once into the um generational wealth probably and asset creation business of uh of in real estate investing so what triggered that shift in you and why do you think a lot of realtors don't ever get that I think because uh, real estate agents are are really service providers. You know, they're they're not they're not in the business. They're just helping transact the business. And you know, for whatever reason, I think they're scared, right, to to get involved or to take the risk associated with what it takes to acquire your first property, where they don't want to deal with it. I mean, there's there's a thousand excuses anyone could make. But I also, you know, I heard, I kept hearing the joke of uh, you'll never go to a real estate agent's retirement party, right? They'll just because they'll work till they'll till they die because they're always doing transactions. And I I knew from the beginning I was like I, I don't want to be a transactional real estate agent. I don't want to keep going through the motions. So I just every uh, you know I just started saving every additional penny I made. Now the first two years uh, into this, I invested it all back into education myself, uh, learning myself, conferences, and coaches. So I immediately started spending whatever uh, excess money. We actually, uh, I paid myself $10,000 a month, even though I was earning way more than that, $10,000 a month was just like my salary. And that was it. Everything uh, that, that was after that went towards conferences, travel, and coaches. And, uh, and so that way I could hyper learn again, I could, I can invest as much as possible back into my business and grow, build relationships. You know, the, the relationships that I've established through going to conferences and meeting other influencers and other top agents and top, uh, real estate people and top business coaches, and even hiring some of them is, has, has really sped up my learning curve drastically. So the first two years I did that, once I felt like I've got, you know, a good establishment that my third year now, I said, okay, now I'm going to start stacking cash in, in investments, you know, and start acquiring that. But I'm also, uh, you know, cause now I have three companies, I, I'm a little too busy and I don't want to focus on the GP side of multifamily or actually doing deals. And, and that's what I like about multifamily is you can get in on the LP side or limited partner. So I like the opportunity where I can invest in real estate, not have to be responsible for everything. I can focus on my core businesses because that's what's going to make me the most money right now. And I'm not saying in, in three to five years, I might move into multifamily full time, maybe, maybe, but 
what's making me a lot of money right now is my core businesses. I want to keep focusing on that, but I want to invest at the same time. So I just started getting into uh, uh, multifamily deals. Now I'm invested in 752 doors uh, across four different complexes. Uh, actually, and now I just invested again in my fifth deal. Uh, that just closed up. That's more of a, that's a fun, that's a uh, boutique hotel fund. So I just added that in there as well. So any, every time I, I, I stack up 50 or a hundred K I'm just like, where do I get, where do I put that? You know, it's not going to sit in the bank. It's like, let me get that into some deal somewhere. And that's very smart. So you're actually going down the route that we have been going down for the last 15 years or so. We are 20 something years. We are our number one, what we call cash machine is our land flipping business. Right. Number two, we have a coaching company and so an educational company. And number three, then we take the money from everything we make and we roll that into assets like and our preferred asset is multifamily. We have in the meantime, the first we started as GPs, uh, no, as, as LPs, I'm sorry, as limited partners, passively investing. Now we are actually GPs on every deal that we do and just closed one a couple of weeks ago and uh, looking for more to do. So uh, you're, you're that, that, add, that adds three businesses. And I tell you, yes, as once you get full more full time into the multifamily side, it starts taking on more of your time too, particularly once you want to, if you want to do a really good job and managing up these properties and 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 repositioning and making them into really gems out there. Um, great. So with that said, how does anyone get a hold of you? How do they contact you? I, I hear you have an educational conference coming up not too far in the future. Um, actually, where I live, close to the Phoenix area, right? Yeah, we're going to be in Vegas at the end oh, of April. Vegas, that's right. Yeah, we're going to be in Vegas at the end of April. Uh, so yeah, you can check that. I'm sure if you go to passiveprospecting.com, you'll see that there. If you want to get a copy of the book, you can go to book. Actually, you can just go to passiveprospecting.com. We have the book there. We have the live event. Of course, you can just play around on that website and, and find everything that we have. And most of the time, if you want to hit me up personally, it's on Instagram. So just at Levi Lassick and, and that's simple. Uh, great. So thank you very much. I love talking about the realtor side of things. Again, we always like scratch our head. We have a lot of realtors that come to us and bridge the gap from real estate into from realtor into land flipping, but it's still sometimes it's, I, I have to scratch my head on an ongoing basis. Like for example, my 16 year old daughter has a deal on a contract that by the time we publish that is probably closing right there, uh, that she got under contract for a few thousand dollars and she's selling it for way more than she purchased it. She's selling it for $40,000 and she wow. got a contract for six. And we're actually selling it through a realtor, even though I have a real estate license actually too in Arizona. I don't use it. I've never used it. I've never represented a client. I have it just to represent myself in larger transactions that save some commission and have access to some of the tools like MLS and so on. But, um, but in the process, every time we have used realtors for lots and lots of our land deals, We've never gotten the question from the realtors is like, how come I work for the six or 10% side and you guys making 500%, right? Yeah. They're just, and you answered it. It's because realtors think of service providers. So if you're a realtor thinking or listening to that, you got two choices. If you want to be the best realtor out there, go attend uh, Levi's session here, Le Levi's, uh, go attend Levi's conference. And of course, if you want to be a realtor that switches over to the other side, then Check out our stuff too. But either way, like I think it's always good to have a cash machine. We have lots of students in our in our area that are part-time over time realtors that over time phasing down. But but by it's always worth learning more about what you already do and becoming the best in the in the industry. And what you have created, I think, can be replicated. And that's one of the key things to the successful education business. If what you have can be replicated by the average person out there then you got something that get, can take off like wildfire. And I think you do here. And obviously you do already because you're probably have, you have uh, very successful students. So congratulations to that guys, check it out, passiveprospecting.com. And with that said, that concludes our episode for today. As always, make sure you give us that five-star review. Make sure as you share that with everyone out there, whether you're watching or listening to this, uh, give us that review, give us that thumbs up, give us that follow, share it with your friends because that's how we hack the algorithm and that's how we tell the world that, that, that to actually boost our podcast so that more people hear about the great guests that we have here. With that said, thank you very much.